Hello, my name is Rebecca Tapp and this is the DNA of Purpose podcast where we explore purpose as a part of who we already are. We showcase all inspiring stories of the most purpose-driven people on the planet with the intention of giving you the tools to step into the potential of who you were always born to be. After all, it's in your DNA. DNA. Welcome to another episode of the DNA of Purpose podcast. Now, here's a question for you. What if purpose has nothing to do with an individual's pursuit for meaning, but instead is a quality that is symbiotic with our innate desire to belong and to trust those who make up our tribes, our communities and our workplace cultures? What if the reason, purpose or the pursuit for a purposeful life is sometimes misunderstood is because we don't get the contextual drivers, drivers such as trust, connection and belonging, the parts of us that are primed for collaboration, over competition and that empower diversity by design. Why? Because these qualities not only keep us alive, but enable us to adapt and thrive. To frame this up, we live in a world where we've been exposed to an invisible narrative of seek out success over significance, pursue the promotion over the purpose, and stay on the rat wheel chasing those golden carrots. Because if you do, your reward at the end is a quote-unquote meaningful life. Sadly, for many people, this equation can lead to burnout rather than brilliance. Within that race, we often miss the moment-by-moment meaning makers, the acts of kindness and connection, the moments where we can empower co-creation and invite in conversations that enable us to view the world through a different lens. What if we chose again? And within that, what if we started to think about purpose also through a new lens? In fact, what if the possibilities for a more purposeful life were not about our ego and instead were reliant on the unique contribution we make within our tribes, within our communities and with those who make up our world? And in leading on from those questions, what can science tell us about how our brain responds to attributes such as trust, belonging and our desire to give back? Could it be that purpose itself is evolutionary? Now, today's conversation is a good one and I'm so excited to dive in. Today's guest is Paul Zak. Paul is the founding director of the Centre for Neuroeconomic Studies and Professor of Economics, Psychology and Management at Claremont Graduate University. He is the founder of Immersion Neuroscience, and for more than two decades, his research has taken him from the Pentagon to Fortune 50 boardrooms to the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. All this in a quest to understand the neuroscience of what makes humans tick. Paul has been obsessed with uh, human connection for as long as he can remember. His focus on understanding connection led to his groundbreaking research on oxytocin. And all of this work led to the best title ever. And no, it's not PhD or keynote speaker. It is Dr. Love. His latest book is Trust Factor, The Science of Creating High-Performance Companies, and it uses neuroscience to measure and manage organisational cultures to accelerate business outcomes. His 2012 book, The Moral Molecule, The Source of Love and Prosperity, recounted his unlikely discovery of the exact neurochemical that drives trust, love and human morality. So on that note, get ready to dive into the wonder and the magic of what I am going to call Neuropurpose with the one and only Paul Zak. Welcome to the podcast. 
Paul J. Zach, it is such a pleasure to have you on the DNA of Purpose podcast as a guest today, beaming all the way into the studio from California, I believe. Woohoo! Yes, from California. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm I'm so excited to be talking to you today. And, um, you know, as you can imagine, across the course of this podcast, I get to speak to some of the most purpose-driven and intelligent people on the planet, such as yourself, which is um, why I'm always curious to ask this one leading question. As someone who has spent much of your time immersed in the world of cutting-edge research and as a science communicator translating that data for everyday folks such as myself, is there any one idea, trend or project that you have come across or that uh, that you've been pondering that might have been, you know, keeping you awake at night that you believe will significantly influence human progress in the 21st century? Gosh, that's a deep question. <laughs> <laughs> we dive straight in. <laughs> I tell you. Um, yeah, I've been obsessed with the neuroscience of extraordinary experiences. So no one wants to have a so-so customer experience. No one wants to see a movie that's terrible. No one wants to have a romantic partner who's blah. Um, and so we've been spending about 15 years looking at what distinguishes ordinary experiences from extraordinary experiences and looking at the behavioral outcomes of that. So I think as we enter into a world of not only big data, but ginormous data, there's the opportunity to customize experiences at scale so that everyone gets really what makes them um, as satisfied as possible. And I think that's a really a, a major change that's, change that's coming to the world. Mm. Fascinating. And, and I have to ask, I imagine some of your, your research as a neuroscientist would, would pair up with that data. Am I correct in saying that? That's right. So we've been uh, running experiments, like I said, for about 15 years to identify the signals in the brain that tell us that something is extraordinary. Yeah. And we find is that behaviorally extraordinary experiences provoke us to take action. They're enjoyable. They are memorable. Um, so they're actually a way to not only create a great experience for somebody, but actually to influence their behavior. Mm. I have many more questions about exactly that as we progress throughout the course of the conversation today. But before doing so, I'd love to I'd love to know a little bit more about your world. And um, I think it's fair to say that you are a multifaceted and, and multi-talented human as a scientist, an economist, a psychologist, entrepreneur, and today as a business influencer. In the spaces in, in between, you've pioneered disciplinary fields, including neuroeconomics neuro management and neuro marketing. Now, I'm sure we'll talk about all of these fields of, of research in one way or another, but before doing so, I'm really curious to understand more about the evolution of your personal purpose. When you look back and, and connect the dots, was there a, a key moment or an unfolding of events that led to a point in time where, where I guess all of the different storylines that, that make up who you are and what you do came together and your, your life's work became obvious? Another profound question. I think my professional purpose has been to create knowledge and technologies to allow people to live more satisfied lives. Mm -hmm. Um, and as I, uh, you know, I've spent 25 years, uh, you know, in an academic laboratory creating new knowledge, I've also worked very hard to take some of that knowledge and turn it into tools that everybody can use, turn it into software generally. Um, and I think uh, going that extra distance is what increases the impact I'm able to have on the world, not just make this information available to scholars, but actually. Um, go further and create tools so everybody can use this um, to be a little bit happier. Mm. I'm so curious to understand, and I'm already going off script, and I, and I kind of knew that I would over the course of today's conversation, but it's I was having an interesting uh, conversation a couple of days ago with a friend of mine who is a mindfulness expert, and, and I made a bit of a joke about the fact that we all have an internet opposed to the internet. But it then got me thinking about the overlay between how the internet and data works uh, in reflection and in relation to how our brain works. Are there any links there as somebody who studied both? 
Oh, I love the word internet. Yeah, so we have an internet, but that internet, like the internet, is in fact connected to other people. Yeah. And so uh, what we find uh, from a research perspective and an applications perspective is that we only thrive, we only uh, live fulfilled lives when we are connected to others. It's the only way to be successful. And I think that's where purpose comes in. Mm. Um, when one has a purpose to connect and even be of service to others, then you get this reciprocation and it's like um, multiplying your brain many fold, right? What I can do by myself is a small amount compared to what I can do on an effective team. And the precursor for that sense of connection uh, is something called psychological safety. So you've got to be sufficiently comfortable around these people so that you trust them, you're willing to put in effort for group goals, and, and that's where purpose comes in. So purpose has, again, a particular signature in the brain that uh, increases our sense of empathy, um, relaxes us when we're in a safe environment, and motivates us to put effort in to help others. Mm. And and I, I know that all relies on on one wonder chemical uh, known as oxytocin. And again, I am I have got lots of questions about that because this is certainly your your area of mastery, so that we can understand why purpose has that effect uh, alongside trust and generosity and and some of the other areas that you have studied. Now, I learned a little bit about all of those things because I was watching a, a very famous TED Talk that you did in, in 2011. But before before diving into that, you know, it's fair to say you're the, you're the founder of Immersion Neuroscience and you and your team have spent much of the last 20 years measuring brain activity to predict what an experience will induce emotional reactions. Now, as you know, today's podcast is, of course, centred around purpose and we've already we've already gone there. And within that, there is this kind of fundamental belief that people are good and that the vast majority of humankind wants to create a more equitable and loving world. But that relies on one thing, and that's the existence of human morality. Now, in in the TED Talk, you spoke in detail about the research you conducted linking oxytocin to human trust and morality. So as a starting point, what is this wonder drug, a wonder chemical, oxytocin, and and why is it so significant to human evolution? So, yeah, about 20 years ago, we started asking why people would ever be good, particularly when no one's looking, when you're by yourself, when you're anonymous. And uh, based on extensive literature on animals, we developed a tool, uh, an ability, a protocol to measure the acute production of oxytocin in humans, uh, originally in their blood and now uh, non-invasively with uh, wearable sensors, and we found that oxytocin in combination with some other neurochemicals in your brain um, is released when someone essentially is nice to you in a, in a tangible way, helps you, smiles at you, uh, sings with you, dances with you. Anything that we do uh, consensually together with each other causes release of this chemical. Uh, and, and as I said, a couple others, but that motivation to have uh, an underlying biology of morality seems to be largely driven by oxytocin. So mm. there's this kind of deep question in, in human behavior, which is if I see you do something, Rebecca, that I think is uh, inappropriate, you know, we, most of us kind of jump to this conclusion initially that, oh, you're a bad person. Mm. Or you've done something bad, therefore you must be a bad person. So that's called the fundamental attribution error. And what we find experimentally, having measured now thousands of thousands of people, is that most people who behave badly are good people, that is, they have good personalities, having a bad time. Um, mm. So I mentioned psychological safety. So one of the factors that inhibits uh, pro-social behaviors, moral behaviors, good behaviors, is high levels of stress. And so we've all had that experience where you're super stressed out, uh, you had a car accident, and your dog died, whatever, and you're just cranky to the people around mm. you. And then you've got to go in the next day to work or at home and go, oh, gosh, I was terrible yesterday. I apologize. I was having a really bad day. And I think I lashed out at you. So we've spent a lot of time looking at the factors that promote or inhibit these good behaviors, which, again, most of the world depends on good behaviors. Right? We don't have a policeman in every corner. We don't have our bosses uh, have a camera over our shoulders to make sure we're working every second of the day. So we rely on essentially uh, reciprocal behavior. We're going to pay you at work. Mm. And in return, you promise to work reasonably hard. Mm. Uh, so again, I can, I can put a lot finer point on that. 
and what kind of environments would I work really hard? What kind of recognition? What kind of opportunities uh, increase the opportunity that I have this connection uh, to the purpose of the organization? So that's the work we've done. So yeah, so for the listeners, I'm sorry, to summarize that, 95 plus percent of the people that we've uh, measured, again, thousands of thousands, who even behave badly generally are good people who are having a bad day. So mm. um, have some tolerance. Humans are going to be variable. Our brain lives in a soup of about 200 neurochemicals. We don't know what those neurochemicals are doing. And so if someone misbehaves uh, at some point, at first, at least give them a break. We do find about 2% of the population are psychopaths. Yeah. These are individuals who have a dysfunction in oxytocin. They lack empathy classically, and they can't be remediated, right? If they work for you, they're never going to get better. They are stuck the way they are. Uh, and these people you have to cut loose. But 2% is not bad. The missing 3%, I said 95% are great people. The missing 3% are, are good people having a really bad day. So, you know, as as members of groups, as leaders, as supervisors, we've got to differentiate between this is a person who, you know, is never going to come around. It's always going to uh, kind of use and abuse the people around them. Or this is a good person who's really having a bad day. And then we should have a conversation about that. And the other, mostly another 95% who are actually trying their best and generally put in effort and are good human beings. Mm. So, I mean, basically what, what I'm hearing you say there is, is that we have a biology of trustworthiness as a result of oxytocin in, in healthy people in 95% of the population. However, the next question after that was is, is around whether, you know, trust, human generosity and purposeful intent are also innate to being human. I understand the only way that you could determine that was was via the use of an oxytocin inhaler in some of your experiments, uh, enabling you to measure the variations in human behavior as a result of this chemical. No, no. We developed a protocol to measure the acute production of oxytocin by doing very rapid blood draws. So I've right. done about 10,000 blood draws, Rebecca, in the last 20 years. The inhaler just shows that. So the blood draws tells us what the, what the brain does naturally. The inhaler just shows if I push on the oxytocin lever in the brain, I actually can get more positive social behaviors, more moral behaviors, more good behaviors. Yep. So in fact, yeah, the blood work is much more interesting. And as I said, now, now we have wearable technology that allows us to measure this in real time uh, without having to uh, poke a needle into your nose or into your arm. Wow, that's incredible. So how do, how do you actually go about conducting those experiments with people? Yeah, so um, uh, it, oxytocin is this super old uh, chemical, uh, and so it's evolutionarily old. And when we uh, identify a way to provoke the brain to release it, yep. like someone being nice to you, we can see that effect both in the brain and in the blood. So we can do that with brain imaging. We can do it with blood draws. Uh, it turned out that also there are receptors for oxytocin in the vagus nerve, this nerve that enervates your heart. And so we can measure with things like electrocardiogram a, um, uh, the effect, downstream effects of oxytocin. So there's a whole variety of ways to do this. And that has allowed us to do field studies. So as you know, I've done field work in Papua New Guinea. Yep. I've done a lot of work with, uh, with companies to create technologies to allow them to ask whether the culture they're creating within their company Creating maybe is too strong a word. They were the culture in their company. Sometimes it's just there randomly. We don't think about creating it, you know, thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. It just happens. Whether that's really effective. Are people really able to work effectively as a team? Are they as productive as they could be? Are they inducing reciprocal oxytocin release in each other so that we are all bonded as a team? So oxytocin is this chemical of connection. So what we see, even for people who have never met before, if we can create an experience in which they release oxytocin, they begin to treat strangers just like family. So it's, I'm going to invest my energy and resources to help you. If my brain says, oh yeah, Rebecca is a great person. She's safe to be around. She's part of my team. Um, I want to put some effort into helping her. Yeah. So Paul, while we're on the subject of purpose, I know in the, in the early days, you conducted a study where you showed videos that warned viewers about public health issues such as heart disease and, and drunk driving, and each participant had $5 in their hand and had the option to donate to charity. And sure enough, the participants who received oxytocin uh, donated 56% more money to 57% 
more charities and reported more concern for the people shown in the PSA as compared with placebo recipients. I understand that you've also done a lot of other uh, experiments around purpose since then. What did you learn about human purpose from these experiences? Human purpose is another way to induce the brain to release oxytocin. So purpose is a broad word. So I want to be a a little more narrow. So we think in the business setting, uh, what I call transactional purpose, how we, you know, uh, create value uh, for our customers. That's the kind of the doing of business. But we found is uh, what I call transcendent purpose, this um, larger purpose of organizations um, that Peter Drucker and Edwards Deming talked about, you know, how we create value for society that that notion of purpose uh, is very motivating for humans. It induces oxytocin release, gives us that extra boost and extra effort. And because we can measure these effects uh, now second by second, even millisecond by millisecond, we're able to go in and take messages, uh, videos, marketing, and create very high impact messages that motivate people to take an action to help other people. So it could be donation to charity, could be working harder for your team members. We've done this many different ways. Uh, And Immersion Neuroscience, the company I started, um, has commercialized that technology using data from smartwatches so that anybody can measure what gives us a sense of purpose, what motivates individuals to actually put in effort, discretionary effort in particular at work. Mm. What I find interesting about this is I've always uh, had a firm belief just through the the hundreds of conversations I've had with people about the nature of purpose. The purpose is actually a feeling. It's it's an emotion. It's it's an energy. And that's why it's so powerful with regards to influencing our behavior. And so what I'm understanding from what you're saying now is it's not just about the narrative of purpose. It's not just about knowing your statement of why. It's about the experience that you have through that emotional release. Would I be correct in saying that? Yes, it's that, as you said, that's that inner net, which is connected to everybody around. I think purpose is most powerful when it has a social component. How about that? Yeah, yeah. So in another video I I came across, I know you also linked a scarcity mindset to a lack of oxytocin. And I thought that was that was also interesting that that you were maybe saying that countries that were less fortunate or had more crime as as two random examples also had a population with less oxytocin. Certainly with less trust. So again, it's that stress response. We've got to create environments where people can flourish. And the first part of that is psychological safety. So we think of children, right? Children who grow up in a really unstable household. They don't know what's going on from day to day. They don't if they have a meal coming to them. Very difficult to focus on school, to uh, feel comfortable, to learn something new. So you can think of psychological safety as uh, kind of bandwidth, right? If I have high psychological safety, I'm relaxed. I have lots of cognition available to acquire new information, to do new things, to learn new things. So what applies to individual humans, it turns out also applies to countries. So countries that are very unstable, that suffer with violence, political instability, then people are just trying to get through the next 12 hours, mm-hmm. right? They, they don't have a chance to invest in a business or put their kids in school. Uh, they're just trying to get through the day. So um, really, it's maintaining that level of stability. It doesn't mean boringness, by the way. One of the uh, interesting things we found is that uh, I have to make a precursor say, but so your brain turns out to be a very lazy organ because it takes so many calories to run your brain. About a fifth of your caloric intake is devoted to the three pounds of your brain. Mm. So there's very high overhead. So the body manages that overhead by having people kind of idle in what they're doing. So you actually need some motivation for the brain to release oxytocin, to have that sense of purpose, to uh, invest the energy into doing something that helps others or helps the world. So from a uh, kind of management perspective, if I'm supervising people, I don't want them to be so relaxed that they're just, you know, bumps on a log, right? We really want to have people be in that kind of moderate stress level where they're focused, they have a goal, they have a, a, a milestone to meet. And that's when they draw on these social resources, my colleagues at work, all this information to reach those milestones. If I have no goals, if I have no purpose, then there's really no reason for me to engage. So this is your, um, I'm making this up now, your lazy, lazy brother-in-law, Rebecca, who sits on the couch <laughs> playing video games all day. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, right? So that person who's just stuck there playing video games in their mom's basement, lack a sense of purpose, lack the sense of connection and doing something great for the world where many of us are privileged to have this sense of purpose. And again, it's almost always social purpose. 
Yeah. Uh, so that's where this high performance come from, comes from for individuals and for organizations. So, Paul, I'm going to, I guess, uh, dovetail into a slightly different area because I want to unpack how some of this works uh, with regards to, you know, an organisation. If you were, you know, if you were consulting, which I'm sure you have with with a leader, what kind of measures would you bring into an organisational structure to build a, a culture of trust and a culture of belonging and purpose and all of the things that you're talking about? Have you got any strategies that leaders who might be listening can deploy? We do. I may, may have written a book on this called Trust Factor. <laughs> um, so I, I think for a couple of years ago, for organisations always think about culture as a, a dimension that a lot of organizations don't think about, um, and yet it has a powerful impact on performance precisely for the reasons that you've said, because of trust and because of purpose. Mm. And so by assessing, measuring your culture, then you can begin to manage it for higher performance. So again, culture is this giant word. Um, one aspect of culture that we know has a profound impact on performance is organizational trust. Uh, and so in Trust Factor, I developed a, a, a measurement tool that allows us to look at the behaviors that underpin um, high trust, high performance organizations. So again, for listeners, uh, trust is uh, a set of behaviors. It's, it's not a personality trait, it's not a feeling, it's actually how people treat each other. And that's something as a, as a leader that you can affect. And so the first thing is to measure that culture, or at least measure trust in that in that culture, and then um, create interventions so that you can move up the level of trust. So so think of trust as kind of a bank. Mm. If I have a lot of trust in my colleagues, right, they depend on me. I can depend on them. And even if something goes wrong once in a while, right, uh, you know, no one's perfect. Someone will not follow through on something they tell me to do. Right. I've, I've got a lot of trust in the organization. I'm like, hey, Bob, what happened? Man, you were supposed to help me with this project or you promised me this report last week. Right. Then, oh, man, I'm so sorry. So that's what people in high trust cultures do versus I'm not returning your messages or your emails because I don't care about you and I'm not going to help you with your project anyway. Mm. Um, so, again, lots of literature out there showing that that's important. The trust is important. Let's come back to purpose. Purpose is why we're doing what we're doing. And we find in organizations in which that purpose is lived, it's part of your DNA, it's part of every conversation, mm. that people are much more motivated. So I'll give you a concrete example. Um, I was at LinkedIn a couple of years ago, and every group I met with at LinkedIn said, at LinkedIn, as I walked in the room, they said, hi, Paul, nice to meet you. At LinkedIn, our purpose is to make our members more productive and more successful. Now, they have that data. They can actually measure if people are more productive, more successful, and that's a screen. Everything they do has got to focus on those two things, or at least one of those two things. If it doesn't, they shouldn't be doing it. So that's a lived purpose. It's very clear. Everyone articulates it. And I love that every group says it when a new person walks in the room. So it's got to be alive. That purpose has got to be part of your um, daily practice. Otherwise, it's just a poster on the wall. Mm, mm. And look, I'm curious to know, because in, in again, in the conversations I've had about organisational purpose, often what I have felt was the missing piece is that you can come in uh, from the top with a purpose and say, hey, this organisation is, is working to raise money for this charity or is a social uh, enterprise who is solving this problem. But if, if the workers aren't actually engaged in that purpose, if there is not an alignment, does it still have the same impact? And how do you go about aligning personal purpose with that of the role and that of the organisation? Um, have you have you looked into that at all with regards to any of your research in organisations? We have. What a great question. Mm. It, yeah, it's really high, hiring for culture fit. So if you are yeah, you're raising money to, uh, uh, you know, to save uh, abandoned animals, and you really don't care about animals, you don't have pets, you're not committed to it, you're just going to do the minimum. I mean, that's just kind of human nature. So um, one of the companies that I talk about a lot in the book, and I've done a lot of work with is Zappos, online uh, shoe and clothing seller. And uh, they're famous for their culture. For listeners, if you're ever in Las Vegas, you can go on their culture tour for $10. Amazing. Uh, take a break from gambling. Uh, I recommend it highly. Um, and so uh, at Zappos, you know, they're uh, really clear about hiring for culture fits. They get about 30,000 applications for every job they post. They can be very picky. 
and they want to make sure that people fit uh, what they call their core family values. So I think family is a very interesting word there, right? They mm. see themselves in a the family. So when we've done uh, neuroscience experiments with the Zappos employees, which we've done a couple of times, including taking blood from them while they worked, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, we ran these on weekends. This is, this is uh, you know online retail, so they work 24-7. We ran this on weekends, and we were off their campus, but nearby, and I noticed that almost everybody who showed up, even on, on their off work day, wore some logo gear from, from Zappos, t-shirt or sweatshirt. After a while, I started asking them, like, hey, it's your day off. What, how come you're wearing a Zappos sweatshirt? And the answer I got literally every time was, oh, that's part of my personality. I see myself as, myself as a Zappos person. I absolutely love that example. That is so true. You know, like that is so true. You're not going to wear your work brand outside of work unless you 100% own it. And so that's culture fit. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That they have, you know, had people who were absolutely qualified for jobs that they didn't hire because of culture fit. And you may know this in the listeners may as well, but they even after they hire people do two weeks of training and after two weeks, pay two weeks, they say, we think you're a great fit. If you still don't think you're a perfect fit for our culture, We'll pay you a month's salary to walk away. Mm. Wow. But think how much cost saving that's involved. So we invested two weeks in you. We didn't invest a year in you. And if this is not something you really want to do, rather than invest much more time and money, walk away. So they tell me a little less than 10% of the people actually take that deal and walk away. Mm. Um, they're like, oh, maybe it's not the best fit for me. But that means they're batting 90% on hires and their turnover is extraordinarily low. So um, really, it's hiring for people who just love this. So again, the term of art is discretionary effort. But if I have to somehow browbeat you to, you know, work more efficiently, to uh, close more sales, you know, whatever you're doing, um, that for me as a supervisor just burns a lot of my time. But if you love what you're doing so much that you would do it without being paid, or you would you'll do it from home. Mm. Oh, I think the COVID uh, lockdown data has been so interesting, hasn't it? Where it looks like people are working at least an extra hour when they work from home than they work in the office. Mm. So that's a great uh, example of self-management. And I think uh, what we see in high-purpose, high-trust organizations is a high degree of self-management. Yeah. I know what I need to get done. I know what my team needs. My supervisor's checking in with me. And the model that seems to motivate that most effectively is kind of a servant leader model, kind of an inverted pyramid where the supervisors are checking in. They're helping people be successful. They're giving them the resources they need to um, meet their milestones. And that, again, is to me a high purpose organization where mm. we know why we're doing this. We just all want to get better. Roll up our sleeves. Let's all work together and get this thing done. Mm. But to your point, it's also nurturing that belonging, even though everybody is at home and not in the same space and, and not physically in teams, they're still nurturing that sense of belonging to something bigger than themselves. Absolutely. And one way to do that that I recommend is what I call the emotional check-in. So, mm. you know, when we're in the office, Rebecca, you know, I run into you and say, hey, Rebecca, how are you? And you say, oh, my weekend was bad or whatever. Um, so we can take the first five, seven minutes of a meeting, even if it's scheduled on Zoom, and say, hey, Rebecca, you are, now fill in the blank with an adjective. You look happy, sad, worried, tired, mm. right? And then we, we open up the emotional channel to say, oh, yeah, you know, I really am tired. I have a puppy. I was up all night. It's really sick. I'm worried about it. Right. And then from a social connection perspective, from a management perspective, I have the opportunity to gain that additional information from you, but also to um, adjust how we work based on your ability to perform. So I'd much rather have someone go home, resolve whatever issue is, you know, kept them up all night and then come back tomorrow and go full steam again, because I want you in that moderate stress level where you're focused, you're putting all your effort into creating value for the organization, rather than presentism, where you're blocking in the clock, but you're not productive. So I'd rather go, you know what, you, you know, is your team on target? Yes, great. Why don't you go home and get a nap? You know, uh, take a break today. Don't, you know, you guys are on target. Don't worry about it. Oh, gosh, wouldn't that be great if your supervisor was that plugged into your emotional state? Would you not put extra effort into this organization? Sure you would. Mm, mm. And, and um, you know, you've spoken about this already today, but it, it really makes me realise the importance of emotional intelligence in the workplace with regards to creating a, a safe environment for people. Because, I mean, I know when I was growing up, 
just naming emotions wasn't necessarily a safe thing to do. You know, if anything, you were maybe taught to re- to repress emotions or keep things down. Um, and then a lot of us have taken that into into adult adulthood. Do you think organisations are focusing and creating more space for emotions in the workplace as as a way to really create a, a more belonging space, a more purpose driven culture, and to help people improve their performance? I think there's a real split. I think mm. we're seeing this in, uh, for example, many tech companies where I live in California, demanding that their employees get back in the office. And employees are saying, you know what? I don't want to do that hour commute each way. Like, I'm super productive. My team is just hitting all their milestones. Why would I go back in the office? And they say, well, we're going to ding your salary if we don't see you. Best a low trust uh, kind of environment. Mm. Um, so I think there's been a real split. But um, around the world, we're seeing labor shortages. I mean, pre-COVID uh, lockdowns, we certainly saw, saw labor shortages. Even in developing com- countries like Mexico are starting to face labor shortages. Um, and there's a small subset of people who are really your high performers. So from a culture perspective, why not create a culture where people can grow, they have, have transparency, they have control over their work lives. Um, that's when people really perform at their best, rather than demanding, asking rather than forcing, offering, right? Create an environment where people really feel like they are doing what they want to do and doing something important. Um, So I don't want to lose those high performers. I want to create a culture where I can keep them here and not go work for somebody else. And so generally that has nothing to do with money. Most people, as you know, don't quit their jobs uh, because of money. They quit because they hate their boss, they hate their job. It's not fulfilling, uh, they're bored. So those are all fixable in terms of a you know, kind of management structure. Um, but I think it does require the culture fit, as you said earlier. Yeah, yeah. So, Paul, the team and I at, at Future Crunch have um, been pondering an idea of late as a part of our recruitment strategy. And the intention is that we want to attract humans uh, that we refer to as full stack humans. So basically what we mean is we want integrated humans who are both analytical yet creative, intelligent yet intuitive, emotionally and intellectually intelligent. So I'm wondering if you put on two hats, which I know you can you can do in that you are both a scientist and a psychologist, is the concept of a full stack human possible? And what can we learn about this balance based on our neurochemical response? Deep set of questions. Wow. <laughs> uh, I'm just loving this time with you. I have to tell you, oh, these are so you. Such important questions. <laughs> I don't think I have a full answer for you, but let me try to try to answer from a scientific perspective. Yeah. Um, there's no real unified you, right? The you when you were 20 is different than the you when you were 30. And from your picture, you're only 31 now. So um, you're <laughs> developing, kind. you're changing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, I agree that we want people who are fully developed, who are uh, you know, cognitively mature and emotionally mature. Um, but the rule in neuroscience is variation. Mm. There's no consistency. So even a, a full stack human, I love that term. I'm going to steal it. Uh, even that person is going to have a bad day. Even that person is going to show up tired one day. Um, and so I, I don't want to hold the bar up to some unattainable, um, you know, uh, apex where everything is perfect every day. I think it's mm. um, full stack humans who are self-aware, who are um, directable and coachable who want to grow and get better. And I think that full stack captures what we found on the sort of three dimensions that create a really productive human being. And that's having professional growth, having personal growth, and then for lack of a better word, having spiritual growth. So by spiritual, I just mean besides work and family, what are you doing that makes you happy to be a human, that improves Mm. the world, that leaves a legacy for you? Mm. When people have all three of those dimensions going, I think they are a full stack human. But I think it varies. Sometimes you're so busy at work, you can't devote as much time to your family. And sometimes your family needs you a lot more and you don't have time for your um, application. So uh, I want to I want to uh, look at that as a kind of a long run average full stack human. And yeah. not, uh, at every point in time, you have to be there. <laughs> Great answer. Now, I'm going to dive back into purpose and, and I guess speak to the psychologist hat again for a moment. In my work in in decoding some of the patterns of purpose, and to be specific, I'm talking about personal purpose here, 
One of the things that I have discovered is that purpose or, you know, a sense of meaning in in one's life is often unlocked in some kind of turning point event. And while sometimes that might be via choice, more than often it is it is in a crisis. And that's a pattern I've noticed time and time and time again in these conversations. With that in mind, I'm curious to understand the connection between our neurochemistry with regards to how we heal, you know, like if we've gone through some kind of trauma, what what role does our brain play in allowing us to heal and recover and find meaning from those events? Oh, such a deep question. We could spend an hour on that. So yeah, the term <laughs> of art uh, is post-traumatic growth. Uh, and so there are a subset, subset of experiences that we have that are traumatic that allow us to uh, do a reset on how we're living our lives individuals' ability to do that is highly variable. Uh, mm. So my own work has focused a lot on victims of um, sexual and physical trauma. Yeah. And in some of those individuals, they have resilience. They're able to bounce back. There are some underlying neurologic markers mm. for resilience, uh, particularly a, a chemical called neuropeptide Y um, that allows us to have that bounce back. So what we often see is after this traumatic event, a period of kind of stasis where people sort of stop Mm. Uh, they don't feel very productive. They're trying to process this information. Um, and that may last up to three months where I'm really trying to get a sense of the new world. What's fascinating about this opportunity, this opportunity for growth after trauma, is that because, as I said earlier, the brain's so lazy, we really don't want to keep doing the things we're doing. So the brain saves energy by essentially forming habits. Those are basically biases in the way that our brain activate for similar situations. Mm. But when you have this traumatic event, you do have have a reset button where all of a sudden you are motivated now to do something new. And people who are able to uh, capture that um, can really do a, a kind of a personality reboot, at least a personal personality reboot, and get to a place where they are more satisfied with their lives, have a greater sense of purpose, um, are better parents, are better citizens, uh, better employees. Um, having said that, some people can't do that. And so mm-hmm. once that stasis period goes along around three months, that's time for some professional intervention. Um, see a psychiatrist or a psychologist, think about you know, getting some help so that you can kind of reassess where you want to be and where you want to grow. And I think that's also the reason to take risk, right? If you never do something risky or new or pushing the boundaries, then you're not pushing your brain to evolve into that full stack human, as you said, mm, Rebecca. Absolutely. Um, so for, for people who haven't done it, uh, I don't know if you've done this, Rebecca, but skydiving, st- volitionally stepping out of, out of an airplane. At I saw the photo of you actually online. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the most uh, life affirming things you can do. It really gives you this confidence that, you know, you can, you can force yourself into areas that just seem, and I had a real fear of heights before I did that. And it just completely cleared out. So that was my reset. My fear of heights literally disappeared in the course of uh, 10 minutes, but people running marathons or triathlons, or there are many ways to do it, but I think we've got to take those risks. And, and also failure is, is fine. I mean, mm. failure in skydiving is not so fine, but you know, um, running that marathon, but not finishing. I mean, just going 20 miles, not the whole 26. Mm. That's an amazing experience. And, and it's a great chance to reflect. Mm. Mm. And rewired the brain, as as you're suggesting there. And I think it's also a, a really important conversation to have right now, given the state of the world over the last two years, that whilst uh, we have just spoken about those, those individual turning points or, you know, individual crisis collectively, we've, we've gone through a huge turning point and that we can also use this, this opportunity of the, well, the, I call it an opportunity, but you can call it a crisis and an opportunity, but it is an opportunity to also reset collectively and to step into a new level of purpose. Absolutely. And so grab that, right? Mm. Yeah, no question about it. Mm. And that's kind of a, a good segue uh, to my next question, which is is really all about the power of storytelling. 
and the stories that we we choose to tell ourselves and to tell the world. Now, I'm not sure how much you know about the work that we do at Future Crunch, but much of our ethos is based on the idea that if we want to change the story of human progress in the 21st century, then we need to change the stories that we tell ourselves. And to be more specific, in a world where we are constantly standing in a fire hose of, of negative news stories on every device, our team really makes makes the point of providing the antidote in that we share stories of innovation and human progress based on the golden facts from the world of science and medicine and, and technology. And our intention is to amplify what we call intelligent optimism in the world because we wholeheartedly believe that to inspire real change, we need to share stories of hope. And this is not to deny that bad things happen in the world, but it's to help people make a conscious decision about the information they consume in the knowledge that it is actually affecting their brains and their bodies. Now, I understand that you happen to know quite a lot about what uh, I'm going to call for the purposes of today's uh, podcast, neuro storytelling. Can you uh, share with our listeners what you've learned about this particular subject in your research? Yeah. Oh, you're so well prepared. Uh, yeah. So we've, we've really found that stories um, have a signature in the brain, effective stories and effective mm. or uh, powerful stories that uh, make them memorable. And again, that's that brain reset. So I remember this information, but it only happens when that story is at human scale, when it has authentic emotions and when it teaches us something. Mm. It, it doesn't work for everybody, different stories for different situations and different people, but there is a classic structure of stories, often a kind of hero's journey story mm. that can be very powerful at giving us insights into our own behaviors. This was um, the dramatic dramatic arc, if I recall correctly. Yeah, dramatic arc, but yeah. particularly a dramatic arc in which um, the protagonist needs to do something difficult, um, almost impossible to resolve a conflict. Mm. And to do that in an authentic way, um, and so I think it's the, so, the whole reason we still go to movies and buy books and uh, you know read fiction, is because we learn something from these stories, particularly these heroic stories, which is a large subset of of the stories that we see. Heroic on the on you know big H and small H. It could be an individual. Um, you know, I, I think you know bringing food to your sick neighbor is heroic at some level. Mm. You don't need to do that. Um, so. Yeah, as we relate these stories, as you said, both to ourselves, but also to others, it gives us a chance to influence the way our own brains work, influence other people's brains, and ultimately um, do a reset on behavior. So mm. uh, and I should say this is, comes from, you know, again, almost 20 years of research, yeah. measuring people's brains as we expose them to different stories. I know there was a story about a little boy, Ben. Yeah, the important component is is the is the role of purpose, right? There's yeah. got to be a purpose. So yeah, this little story of Ben who's uh, dying of brain cancer, two year old boy, and mm. his father, uh, is really powerful. And we've seen other powerful stories like that. But there's a purpose. If you think, why am I watching the story of a kid who's going to die in a couple of weeks? Mm. I'm doing that because I'm learning something about my own resilience, my own ability to, as say, an, as an adult, go through probably the worst experience you could ever have as a parent and yet be stronger because of it. Do something important with your life because of it. And that's very empowering. Mm. So, Paul, my, um, and, and I guess this is a little bit of a, a selfish question, really, but I'm going to ask it. Um, my little girl, Tiger Lily, who's actually out out there in the studio uh, today listening to Mummy's Voice going through the, the speakers, she's uh, three years old and, you know, I can just see that her brain is, is such a sponge. And I also know that, you know, after researching for this interview, that one of the most important things I can do for her for any child uh, or even for myself is to produce a, as much uh, oxytocin and, and other chemicals that are going to enhance trust and enhance belonging and all of the things that we've spoken about over the course of today's podcast. So, you know, as a parent, as a partner, a boss or a friend, especially in, a, in an age of a global pandemic, how can we ensure that we are creating a more trustworthy, generous and kind world? Yeah, I, I have a simple brain, so I try to get a, you know boil everything down to yeah. a, a, a kind of an equation. And my equation that listeners can steal if they like is called love plus. Mm. So for every interaction, 
I try to assess whether I'm adding love to the world. And again, in the in the work setting, that could, that's the philia sense of love, right? Which means you know, friendship or caring. Uh, for your daughter, it's it's uh, parent-child love. Um, and so what I try to do is live my life. I mean, this is my goal. I don't always reach it, but live my life so I'm adding love to the world every day. And I try to reflect on that before I go to sleep. Mm-hmm. What interactions did I have? And why was I of service to other people? Did I help someone, uh, as many people as possible, get better? So I think for your uh, lovely daughter, you know, she's going to be what she is. Personality is largely genetic. So um, as long as you give her plenty of love and enough food, she's going to turn out just fine. Certainly she'll drive you crazy once in a while, <laughs> but um, that's okay. So, so does everyone else around us, right? Our, that's exactly our, right. People we yeah. love will drive us crazy. So um, anyway, that love, love plus mnemonic is, a, I think, a simple way to kind of boil down that we are social creatures. We only thrive when we're in community. And to be in community means that you've got to serve others, and then you can expect them to serve you when needed. Um, so it's really making that investment in the social relationship. So I'll give you one last example. I turned 50 a couple years ago, and I had three surprise birthday parties. And I'm a super nerd introvert, but because of my research, I started investing more in relationships. And that was one example of how that has paid off, has really improved my life. And hopefully I've improved the lives of people around me as well. Well, I can certainly say just in even researching for today's podcast, uh, you've certainly uh, improved my life and and definitely improved um, my understanding of, of not only the brain, but looking more deeply than that, how the brain, how neurochemicals actually influence so so much of what I stand for and this this podcast stands for, which is the creation of a better world. So I want to say thank you so much for the work that you do and the and the full stack human that you are. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Uh, you are wonderful. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And uh, please keep doing your wonderful work, Paul. Before before we go, where can my listeners uh, track you down, read about your work, buy your books, do all the things? Uh, thank you. Uh, you can see the technology. Technology we've, we've developed to measure what the brain loves at getimmersion.com, immersion with an I. And you can find out more about me at pauljzack.com. If you have questions, shoot me an email. I'm happy to uh, engage with your audience. Paul, thank you so much for joining me on the DNA of Purpose podcast. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you would like updates on upcoming episodes as they are released, in addition to good news posts from the world of science and technology, please follow along at our Instagram page, which is at DNA of Purpose Podcast, or sign up to our newsletter at futurecrunch.com. You can also download our brand new ebook on the Great Transformation, uh, which is available at our website. And these links are also included in the show notes. You can think of the Great Transformation document as your build guide to the next economy.